So I record all these classes, and this week someone messaged. So Mac, a guy called Max, he said, Thank you, Rabbi. I met you at the University of Oregon many years ago, but your guidance and now your videos have been wonderful in helping me appreciate and forward my religious thinking. To that, isn't that that was really heartwarming? So, um, you know, sometimes I also like, why am I doing this? Like, why am I bothering with all the recording? I do like it. But sometimes I still think, why am I doing this all? And then, um, you know, it's a message like that, which makes you, you, know, you put your effort. It's been, uh, we have a, a Relatable Judaism, a, a podcast, and it's on already 120, maybe 130 talks already that have been recorded. So. Check it out, when you're on a drive or something, there's so much there, you will love it. There's a lot of uh, discussions, all the Taco Tuesdays that we've done ever since... Not ever since we started. I didn't start recording it as soon as I got here. Probably second, third year. Yeah, but at some point we uh, started recording them. And um, it just, it, you know, sometimes you do things and you think, okay, whatever, I'll do that on the side. It's not even that, it is effort, but it's not that much effort. And I thought, okay, I'll just do this on the side. But slowly I'm getting a lot of messages from people that have been involved with us in the past. And, um, you know, like it's, it's really nice. Okay, so we are now on... Uh, uh, Pukei Avot, and we're discussing some of the wisdom of life from Pukei Avot. I just feel like I'm far from everyone. Um, so uh, it says in Pukei Avot like this, a very interesting idea. And I want to start off with an idea first and then build it into the words. So the idea is like this. There are three types of people that you meet. Either a hierarchy, someone who's above you, or someone who's on the same level as you. And someone who may seem worse to you in your eyes, okay? Which means it could mean in terms of wisdom, you're smarter, but there's always someone who's smarter than you, right? There's three types of people that you're going to interact with, and um, they all need to be worked with, meaning they all could be your friend. They all could be, well, not necessarily your friend, but they can all be someone that you're connected to, and you should have these three. God made these three in the world for a reason, and you need to accept them. Meaning if somebody, let's say, says, uh, I don't believe in a hierarchy, then it's a problem. It's very, very important to have a hierarchy in your life where there's someone to look up to, someone to strive to be. It means that you have a goal, you have an identity. Someone who has no identity, then they don't have a hierarchy, right? I'm, who are you? No, I'm, I'm someone. What, what, what you're trying to do? I don't know. What, what's your goal in life? I don't know. So then there's no hierarchy. But the, the stronger identity you give yourself, the more likely that there'll be a hierarchy that you need in your life. Okay? If, you, if you're striving to do really well in business, then there's going to be someone else in business who's doing a bit better than you, and you're going to want to look up to them and see what they do. Make sense? Uh, so somebody who's on the same level, same wavelength, could be in terms of wisdom, but it could also be in many other areas. Um, a friend, someone same age, someone in the same situation as you, um, someone going through a similar difficulty, someone who can talk to you. And, th and that person could be much greater in many ways than a hierarchy, right? Because they're more relatable. They're going through the same situation as you. And then there's someone who's always what we would call or what seems to be worse off than me. And there's all these three people in your life and you need to accept them. Um, some people might ask me, I don't like it. I don't like the fact that there's some people that are below me and there's some people, uh, people above me. Well, if there was never, think about this, if there was never people that were below, meaning there were never people that were unfortunate, let's say there was never such a thing as someone unfortunate and there was never such a thing as someone who's very fortunate. We're all the same wavelength then, bless you, so then where would we be? Like, what would, what would that mean to life? Think about that for a minute. And this is what the Derech Hashem talks about uh, uh, extensively. He says, imagine there was no poor. So then there'll be also no wealthy. There'll never be charity. Right? The opportunity of you to give is because of the lacking of the other. And that's what causes the bonding of humanity. So, so for instance, you've got a puzzle right? You have a puzzle. How does the puzzle work? How does it stick together? Because there's some pieces that stick out and there's some pieces that are lacking and they need, to put, they need to be put together. That's how puzzles built. 
Well, that's how the world is built. If we were just solid pieces and there wasn't any lacking in anyone, right, then it wouldn't be, a, it wouldn't be us. It wouldn't be the opportunity of charity, giving, taking, having the, the choice of good over bad. But what does that leave us with? A tremendous sense of responsibility. That means that if I see someone lacking, why are they lacking? Because you are there and you know about it. And that means that the fact that you know about it, there's a responsibility in your behalf. They are lacking because of you. In order to give you an identity. How much does that make you feel that you need a responsibility to help them? Right? Because their void is for your identity. Otherwise, if they didn't have a void, then you wouldn't have the ability to give. And that's why we said last week, greater is the person that gives than the one that takes. Although in the physical world, it seems that the one that gives is on the higher end and the one that's taking is on the lower end. But really, the one that's giving is gaining so much more from the taker. Because when I give money or something to someone who's taking from me, they're giving me a spiritual world of meaning and purpose and so much, right? They allow me to be me. So um, if you think about it this way, it should leave you with tremendous responsibility in the surrounding of, 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 of the people around you. Their lacking is because, and my having is for me. And therefore, I am the one that has to fill that void. Otherwise, why is that there? If they were as wealthy as me, and everyone was as wealthy as me, not just financially, but whatever it is, if everyone was the same as me, then what's going to be? We're all the same, so then I don't have an identity. Their lacking is what makes me. Does that make sense? So here's, uh, here's what it says, and I'm going to tie it into this statement that I just told you. It's fascinating. It says like this. Yeshua ben Prachia v'nitai ha'arbali kiblu mehem. Another pair of zugot. There were used to be different types of leadership throughout our history. In every generation there was different leaders and different names for the leaders. This was a time of the Talmud when they had groups of leaders called the Zugot, where they had one who was the head of all the courts and one that was the head of the Jewish people as a whole. And this was after the Rishonim? Um, before, before the Rishonim, before the Talmud, uh, well, during, during the Talmud, but before the Rishonim. Okay, this is the Tanaim, the times of already the Tanaim. They were the people of the, of the Mishnah. Okay, I don't want to get too much into the history of Judaism, but it's really fascinating. And you should... No, no, not you. I'm talking about myself. I don't want to get too into it. But I do want to go through this amazing teaching that they said. So Yeshua ben Prachia Omer, he said three things. He said, make for yourself a master. Who does that represent of those three that I was talking about? The, the hierarchy, right? Make for yourself... This is how to deal with the hierarchy. Make for yourself a master. And Aselech Rav, literally in Hebrew, Rav is what? A rabbi. a rabbi, but literally it means a teacher, right? It, but it means, in context here, somebody who's scholarly in Torah as well. Ukne lecha chaver, and buy for yourself a friend. That's strange. Shouldn't it just say, you know, get a friend? No, buy yourself a friend, whatever that means. It feels like something's about to explode. Did right? But, the uh, no. No. Kine, like Kinyan, it's another way of rechisha. Kinyan is a, a, a not necessarily with property. It's a yeah. form of, of um, rechisha is normally, that's what I understand, is normally with land. And Kinyan is done with things that are movable. Right. Okay, so but it means to acquire. I ask because it could never, people say, uh, can also mean to acquire. So when you think, oh, I'm going to acquire friends. Yeah. Like, it doesn't sound as weird when we say buy friends. It's like, what? Yeah, right. Yeah, what does this mean? And it doesn't mean lechosh, it's kene, kone, and kone mashu. I buy, buy for yourself a friend, which sounds strange. Buy a friend, that's what it says. And then it says, finally, judge, vehevet kol ha'adam lekafschut, judge all of mankind favorably. Okay, give everybody, and it doesn't, well, it doesn't say mankind, it says et kol ha'adam. It doesn't say kol adam, it doesn't say judge every human. It says, kol ha-adam, all of the human. Right, so if you've got somebody in front of you, it's saying, judge all of that person favorably. Not just judge favorably, all of that person, judge him favorably. 
what does that mean? Uh -huh, right? So we have to kind of understand, and what's the connection between them? So I've already made a connection. First it says, make for yourself a master. That's representing the hierarchy. You need to have a hierarchy, somebody who's above you that you look up to and you want to be like. Everyone needs this. And no matter how much of a person you are in your field, there's always a hierarchy that you need to be with. It's, someone once told me, it's very lonely to be at the top of a mountain. And you shouldn't be. Right? There's always someone that can be above that mountain. And if you think that there's no one else, that's why it says in Hebrew, Aselecha, make yourself a, uh, a rabbi. If you think you're at the top of the mountain, and that means you know more than anyone else, still make yourself a rabbi. That's why it's make yourself a rabbi. Even if you think that you are the highest of all, and you say to yourself, well, that guy doesn't know as much as me, still make yourself a rabbi. I'll tell you something interesting. People that train for Olympics, okay, are they the best at what they do? Let's say they are, no. uh, but what's his, who's the fastest runner, uh, what's his name, Usain Bolt? Bolt. Yeah. What was his name? Usain Bolt. Usain Bolt. Does he have a trainer? Yeah. 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 That's strange. How could someone tell him what to do? Yeah. You ever thought about that? Because the trainer needs to make money too. <laughs> there you go. It's about money. The, tra the trainer is there to tell them like, how to improve your speed, how to... Give yourself that agility to keep going forward. Good. But isn't it interesting? From a logical perspective, you're right. From a logical perspective, for a minute, just think about this for a second. Right? You're right that that's what the, the trainer is there to do, is to make sure he's doing everything right. But who are you to speak? Right? Couldn't, couldn't, he say, couldn't he just turn around for a second and say, hey, excuse me? Did you do it in eight seconds like I did? Or whatever it is? How, how dare you? Right? Who are you to speak? He could easily, logically, he could have the pride to say it. I think Tila's crying. Yeah. I pro he probably does say that though. But also, mm. whenever, like a person, and that's a problem if he does. Yes. Like whenever a person is in the in the moment, they don't really see what's wrong and right. So I think that's why you always have to have someone that's outside of you. Yes, objective opinion. Yeah. That no matter what happens, even if you know. By the way, is anyone cold? Cold? Okay, if there is, at some point you can close the window, the door at the back. Because we do have a, I feel like a crosswind. So if you do, you can close the door. Anyone, vote. Anyone want the door closed in the back? Vote? Okay. Okay, we're good. So, no, 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 don't, don't close it. No, don't close it? No, no one put their hands up. So. Brian's a little cold back here. No, I'm not cold. I'm very warm. He's warm at heart. His body's warm. His heart is warm. Everything's good. So, Aselech um, Arav means make yourself a master. Have someone who's objective, and that's what you're also saying. <coughs> Have somebody objective that no matter what happens, even if you are smarter than them, but because you are in that position, is it right for an Olympic runner, champion, to have somebody that's telling him what to do? Of course it's right. Does he need a trainer? Of course they do. Of course they need a trainer. Because no matter how good you are, you need someone to guide you objectively that can watch you from the outside and push you to your highest potential. It's a very interesting point. You can learn from somebody that doesn't even know as good as you because they are objective. Yeah. So it's not to just look at someone as a potential positive role model. It's actually to have a mentor, right? Yes. That's the goal. Yes. The goal is to have a mentor. The best situation is where you look at him as a hierarchy. There's respect, there's real learning, there's listening, there's a listening ear. But even if you believe, that's what it's saying here, even if you believe you are at the top, you're the champion, and you say to yourself, I am the best, it says here, make for yourself a hierarchy, even a situation where you are the hierarchy of all. And there's cases where you might know that you are, like the Olympic champion. Right. You know for sure you're the best at real estate in the whole of uh, the U.S. So you know it. That's it. You've got the name. You're on the, you were the top of the Times or whatever, the Forbes. And you, you won every time and everyone knows you and loves you. you you've it. That's it. You're it. Still, make yourself a master. And I'm not just talking about work. Of course, I'm talking about spirituality here. And that for sure, we need a hierarchy, right? Physically, whatever. It's money, it's whatever. But hierarchy for spirituality is something we need. 
We need someone that's objective to guide us and help us. By the way, dating. Oh, now I got you. So dating. Uh, yeah. Well, dating is. Well, it's always a seminar 2.0. So <laughs> dating is very interesting. Because why? In dating, you have all three of these as well. You'll have somebody that you might meet that's a bit higher than you spiritually. You might meet somebody that's on the same level as you. And you might even meet somebody that's really hot, but they're, um, they're in a lower level than you in terms of what they're doing. Okay? <laughs> That might happen, might happen. I don't think every time, but it might happen. Right? So you might have, there's the three sides that can happen in dating. Could you date someone like that? Could you date someone that's above you? Yes. Yes. Can you date somebody who's on the same level as you? Yes. Can you date someone that's below you? It's really hard. It depends. It depends. Always depends. How? How? In these ways. How can you? I'll tell you how. If you're willing to learn from the person that's higher yeah, than you. Yeah, it depends. If they're willing to like grow in your direction that you're trying to go, then it's okay. But a lot of times they're just like, mm, I don't know if I want to do that. <laughs> exactly, you're right. So. If they're willing to grow and you're in the same direction as you, they could be even lower than you. Then it's fine. Then it's fine. And there's another condition. Of course, you have to be going in the same direction. Also, if someone's above you, you need to be going. No two people on the same level, right, fully. But there could be stages where you can f kind of feel like we're the same wavelength. And there's some people that you're dating that can, you could feel that, wait, they're way above me. And there's some people that you can feel, wait, they're way below me. How do you deal with them personally, internally? For sure, you have to be going in the same direction. That's for sure. But there's something that you have to do as well on these, these three things. Rule number one, if you're dealing with a hierarchy, you're dating someone that's above you, you have to have the humility to say, I'm, I'm willing to learn from this person. If you're going to say, I can't learn from this person, I'm not willing to be under them in terms of having a, a listening ear and understanding that they know a lot more than me, let's say, in whatever area it is, whether it's spiritually or whatever it is, then it won't work. You have to make them for you a master. If they are the same level as you, you buy yourself in as a friend, and I'm going to talk about buying yourself in as a friend, and if they're below you, how do you deal with them? You judge them favorably. You see, if you've got somebody who's below you, you can easily come to the point of how can they be doing this? How did they speak like this? Where did they, what are they saying? Right? So there's all these like judgments that you can go through, judgmental uh, thoughts that can go in your mind. Like, how could I can't believe this? And that. There's a whole list of things that you start judging the person. Judge the whole person favorably. If you're able to do that, you can actually date that person too. Besides for the fact that you have to be going in the same direction, for sure. But you also have to judge that person completely in a favorable manner. If you're able to do that, then there's no problem. Okay, so there's these three aspects. It's amazing. We're just talking about three things and they're so powerful to many areas of life. Yes. In every level of the hierarchy, in a favorable manner, instead of judging them in such a negative way. Of course. But when it comes to someone who's below you, is that not more likely that you'll judge them? You kind of have to like see how rigid their mindset is also, and like where they're heading, you know, kind of like... Of course. By the way, when it comes to dating, in a way, I'm going to talk about this, in, in, when it comes to dating, at least in marriage as well, when it comes to your own personal life, judging favorably doesn't apply. Judge favorably, yes. When it comes to your own personal life, you're not going to start saying judge favorably. You want the best. You want the best spouse, right? Meaning, I'm going to do business with someone. I heard that he did some shady deals with other people. I know that he did some good deals too, but he's, he's, he's got a name. His rating on eBay is... Uh, is that, I just saw you. His rating on eBay is not so good. It's 2.8, right? So I'm, I'm doing a deal with this person, but I know that he's got very bad rating from my friends or whatever. Please don't think of this only as business, right? But you get what I'm saying. This person doesn't have a, do I judge them favorably? Yes. But do I have to marry them? Do I have to do business with them? No, when it comes to my own personal life, that's a different story. You should give them a chance. I give them a chance. I give them a chance, meaning I don't judge them, 
I don't judge them, but when it comes to me personally and the choice of who I'm going to marry, I want to make sure that I have a very good person. Now, I also have to be realistic. I know that I can't. Yes. How do you know someone is above you or below you? Isn't it all circumstance and the moment that you're exposed to them and the perspective that you see them? Well, I can give you examples. It has to do with which avenue of life you're talking about. Yeah, uh, it depends on what you have you. This, in, I'm not just, I'm not, when it comes to dating, obviously it's values. Spirituality. spirituality and values. Okay, so what are their values? Are they like uh, talking about, you know, what do they do in their spare time? That's a good test of seeing someone's values. What do they do when they're free? Uh, you know, I, uh, go, I go to the shooting range, then I get back and I hang out with my friends. Uh, I, uh, I still, I have my PS5 and right, it's kind of shallow, you know. No, and, uh, yeah, and what's wrong with shooting? So uh, there's nothing wrong with all of those things, but there's diff- if you're holding in a different place, and you're like, oh, I'm going to Taco Tuesday on Tuesday night, you know, I'm not going to the... So if you're holding in a different place in terms of your values, where you're holding, you'll know that those are things that you'll say, oh, okay, they could do that once in a while, but that's, why is that the focus of their conversation? That's why dating takes time. It's not like you just date someone and you say, okay, fine, we look good, let's do it, right? Let's get married. It doesn't work like that. It's, it takes time. And what's, what we're taking time with is to see where we're holding in terms of values and if I can handle the fact that either they're above, same level, or below, right? There's, there's, there's a lot to talk about. That's an example. I'm really talking about values and that should really help is, you know, where, where are they holding? What kind of conversations are they having? Look, granted, I'll say that when someone dates, a lot of times they're not being themselves at the beginning. You know, they're, they're being extra awkward and, and uh, trying, to impress. trying to impress. So, you know, it could be that you need to give it some time. But once I do know the person, once I do get to know the person and I say to myself, okay, listen, they, they are great. I'm not judging them. But the, based on the family values and the things that they have, they're very different than mine. They might be a great friend, but not for marriage, because when it comes to marriage, I want, I want someone that's, like, that's the best for me. So that's why judging favorably is important, but not when it comes to you personally. Even, with, even if, let's say, you say to yourself, I can't marry this person, you should still judge them favorably. You should walk away in a happy way, but judge them favorably. The reason why they have these issues is because of the, their difficulties that they had growing up. It's not their fault. That's called judging favorites, not blaming them or, or downgrading them because of their situation. But to say that I have to marry someone because I have to judge everyone favorably is insane. So when it comes to money or my own personal interest, then judging favorably is very, uh, is, is different, okay? Because I'm involved. Kavdel with Khashdel, that's it. So, um, she's right. Okay, Kavdel Khashdel means respect the person in front of you but also suspect Trust but verify. Trust and verify. You know? And you verify. Well, be suspicious. If you're dealing with, you're dealing with someone in, in terms of, you know, you're giving them a lot of money, you're suspicious. Okay, so um, here's the next thing. There's something very interesting as well. It's fine. There are two types of People also, this is another way of looking at the words. It says, make for yourself a master, a rabbi, and buy yourself a friend. By the way, I didn't mention this. What does it mean, buy yourself a friend, and what is a friend? Okay. This is a friend right here, Sari. Okay, good. Why, why is it a good friend to buy yourself into? By the way, what does that mean? You're investing. Invest in a good friend. If it's a good friend, hey, that's weird. Why should I pay myself into that? Give some time for that person. Buy them a drink. Yes. Do everything you can to spend time with people that are positive. Do everything that you can to be with a positive environment. Yes, buy yourself. Even though when you're in school, people thought that's weird, right? As, as an immature level, that people think that people do think that's weird. But really, it's worth investing in people that are good to be around. It's important. And here's, here's another thing that I wanted to say. So there are two types of people. Oh, so what is a friend? Let me tell you what a friend is. Here's three aspects that Rabbeinu Yonah, one of the great commentaries of the Torah, but also of uh, Pirkei Avot, says like this. He says there's three types of things you need to look for in a friend. One is Torah. 
which means deep conversations, insight. Whenever you talk to them, you're left with insight. You're not just having shallow conversations about people, but your conversation is insight. Right? The is second... It, is it insight about just Torah or anything? No, life. You know, they're wise okay. about life. They think about life. Or like deep Good. insight into like something... It doesn't have to be deep, but it just has to be something which is to Torah values, like just values. Someone that has normal conversations, not uh, only things that are outside of values. Okay, so that's number one. A good friend is someone that has good conversation uh, and Torah values. Number two, they only do good with you, meaning every, no one's perfect, but you're both shy enough from each other to not do the bad parts next to each other and only the good parts next to each other. That's what he says. Why? Because that way, you're not pulling each other down. You're shy. You, there's, a certain, there's a certain embarrassment from that person because you hold up each other to a higher standard. And therefore, you're only going to do good together and grow. Okay? So it's the kind of person you get to meet in a positive environment. It's the kind of person that you only see when you do good things. There's some people that told me, they come here, and there's things that they do that they don't want their friends to know that they do. So they do that quietly. I say, you're in a good place. What? Yeah, you're in a good place. Why? <coughs> because when you come here, you're only doing good things and you're shy of telling them the bad things that you're doing. They're holding you to a higher standard. Wait, but what's the difference between that and hiding yourself? Isn't that, doesn't that mean you're being fake? No. Everyone, no one's perfect. But the type of things that you do with each other are good things. Not that you hide yourself. It's the type of things that you do. He comes here to come for a class. He comes here for a Shabbat. Right. Yeah. Okay, so the second is that you do positive things together, but you avoid the negative and that there's a certain embarrassment of doing those together. And the third is that there's trust between you. Meaning that when you go to them and ask them advice, whether it's dating or something like of that kind, if you can open the door, something of that kind, you take advice from each other. Yeah, open it all the way. All the way. All the way. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, and, uh, you guys kill the AC? Or, uh, kill the AC? Yeah, like physically? Or, like, well, Maybe just turn it off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, turn it off, turn it off. If you know how to do it. <laughs> okay. Fine. So, uh, finally, I want to tell you the last thing. We'll scrap the, the three things for uh, buying yourself a friend. But those are the three things. Someone you could trust. Meaning, you could tell private things. How do you know you could trust someone? Huh? How do you know if you could trust them? You give them a test. What's the test? This is actually very important. How do you know if you could trust someone? I'll tell you. Are they telling you things about somebody else? That they tell you, hey, don't tell anyone, I'm telling you this. Yeah. That's a very scary thought. Oh, that, they're doing that about someone else, and who says they're not going to do that about you? Right? So that's the way. Trust is that you can talk to them and have advice from them. They'll keep a sword, a secret between you. You know that whatever you talk to them is between you and them, and it's not going to get around as much as, you, as much as you can. Okay? Now, finally, it says, judge everyone favorably. What does that mean? You ready? What does it mean to judge everybody favorably? Why does it say judge all of that person favorably? Anyone know? It says judge all of the person favorably. What does that mean? Their past, present, and future. Yeah, what else? Well, that's everything, right? It means to believe that they have made good, that they're capable of being better. Well, yes. What's the reason that we judge people? Because we don't judge all of them. Meaning, we only judge a certain aspect. We see only this moment of when they drove past me and they didn't say hello. I didn't oh. see what happened beforehand. I didn't see what happened after. I didn't see the whole process. That's not done. It's called Adam. You're going to judge? Judge the entire person to his entirety. Right? Get to know the entire person. Isn't that interesting? So I'll finish off like this. I'll tell you a story of the Ketav Sofer. Fascinating story. I may have told you before but it really gives you a feel of the idea of judging favorably. You ready? It's a great story. So the Ketav Sofer lived in the, in the 18th century, the beginning of the 18th century, and he was a big, big rabbi. He wrote many books, phenomenal teachings.
that has tremendously changed the dynamics of Jewish thinking. An amazing teacher. And he lived in the beginning of the 18th century. And they had one of the first rabbinical conventions. So all the rabbis from all different parts of Europe got together and they got to meet. And this Ketav Sofer, this big rabbi, he brought with him a special, he wanted to start the meeting in a special note. You know, people traveled all to get to this big Aguda convention, this big convention. He wanted to bring something special. So he started off the meeting by saying, hey everyone, something like that. And he pulled out a coin. He says, I want to show you what I have. And this is how I want to start the meeting to show that we're still here for all these years. He pulls out a coin. It's half a shekel from the times of the temple. And he shows everyone, look, this is what I have. The Jews are still alive. Amisa and Chai. They were going through tremendous pogroms and pain. He takes out the one coin. And he says to them, look, here's, here's the coin. And everyone's like, wow, this is unbelievable from the times of the temple. So what do they do? They pass it around. Many, many people on the table, they start passing it around, passing it around, passing it around. All of a sudden, they, could, they started the convention. All of a sudden, the rabbi says, hey, where's the coin? I didn't get it back. He looks in his pocket, I don't see it. And everyone's worrying, where's the coin? And uh, there's one rabbi, they kept, they, they looked around, they said, does anyone have it? Does anyone have it? There's one rabbi in the far end, I forgot what his name is, Rabbi Hass, Rabbi Hass, or something like that, who was in the far end, who stood up and he says, please, let's wait for another half an hour. Everyone was like, what's going on? Why can't we search for it? Just let's wait for another half an hour. So at some point, one of the people that was organizing the event said, you know what we're gonna do? Everyone has to, this is a very important coin to the big rabbi that came, Everyone's going to have to empty out their pockets on the table. Empty out your pockets. Let's see if you, if maybe you have it. Show us your pockets. So it's a very expensive coin, valuable. So everyone said, fine, no problem. But that wrong rabbi in the far corner says, please, don't empty. No one do that yet. Let's wait another half an hour. And after a good hour, hour two hours, someone comes running from the, one, one of the people that worked in the catering or whatever it was comes from the garbage and comes running with the coin and says, Rabbi, Rabbi, I found it. And everyone was happy, Baruch Hashem, they found the coin, ah. But then they look at the, the, the rabbi at the far end, they said, what's going on? Why did you tell everyone to wait? And he says, I didn't want to embarrass the rabbi, but I also came with exactly the same coin. I had exactly the same coin in my pocket. He pulls out the coin and he shows them, look, the same half shekel that the rabbi has, but he was excited and everyone was looking at his coin. So I didn't want to say that I have the same one. But after the coin was lost, I said to myself, they're all going to think that I took it. So I said, please everyone, wait for another half an hour. And during this past few hours, I've been praying with all my heart that this coin will be found. And thank God the coin was found and everything was fine. And the rabbi, the Ketav Sofer, stood and said, this is the greatest lesson of, of Dan the Kafschut. You have taught us a, an amazing lesson that's worth the whole entire convention. Look, we're now 200 years after that convention. This is the story that's told of that convention. Nothing else is told of that convention. I'm sure good things happen. But this story's traveled around the Jewish people for 200 years. That's the greatness. And he says like this, the rabbi says, imagine we didn't find that coin. And imagine he would have pulled out from his pocket that coin. Would anyone in this room would have thought for a second that he had the coin? And he would say, no, I also had the same coin. Would anyone believe him? No, no. no one would believe him. He said he taught us the greatest lesson of Dan Lekav's Chut. Judging the person, your friend favorably. And that's the great lesson. Is when it says, Dan Adam It's who is it for? For the other person or for you? When we're judging people favorably, it's for you. Do you know how much is going in, in our minds every day? You know the famous example that's given, they always give it over. The guy who's standing at the bus and he wants some help. He's desperate to get home. And finally he's waiting, it's raining, it's pouring. Oh, horrible weather, I'm at university, I'm at school, I want to go home. Suddenly, as I'm standing by the bus stop, I see my best, my best friend's on his way in his gorgeous Tesla. I'm like, oh, not only is, am I getting home, I'm going to get home in a Tesla, fantastic. 
His friend comes right past him. Not only does his friend drive past, he goes in the puddle that's right next to him and gets him soaked. And he's saying to himself, oh my gosh, that's it, I'm done. My friend went in the puddle, got me soaked and drove off and didn't even stop for me. I'm desperate for this ride. So what do we tell him? You don't know the story. Maybe it was your friend, but maybe, maybe, maybe it wasn't your friend. Maybe it was the same car. There's a lot of testers these days. Maybe it was a different car. No, I saw him. Not only did I see him, he waved at me. And I waved to him. He would wave to you and drive off and ignore you? It doesn't make sense. Maybe he has to go somewhere. Maybe his mom is sick and he's running to his mom. No, I know what he's doing today. I know that his mom's fine. I just spoke to his mom. She's staying by my house. What do you mean? She's by his mom? <laughs> so he says, no, but maybe there were people in the back. And there wasn't any seats available. There's no seats available? I saw that there was no one in the car. I saw it's a clear white Tesla that I could see straight through. There was no one in that car. Ah, but you know, sometimes people put stuff on the seats, like boxes. Maybe he had some boxes that he had to quickly deliver. And it was, uh, it was a quick emergency for work. No, back and forth and eventually, maybe, 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 what are the chances? Let me ask you a question. What are the chances that one of those things are right? That really there's another reason why he drove past. A good friend of yours is going to wave at you and drive past and ignore you in the rain. Especially when you're like, you know, he's going to ignore. What are the chances that he's driving past and he got you wet by driving in that puddle, but he didn't intend to? Of course, that's the chance of actually judging favorably is much higher than the other way around. The odds of thinking the other way around is much greater. Anyway, the Chafet Chaim says that Hashem made our mind think in all these crazy ways. You know, like sometimes our mind, I tell people, with my barber, when he gives me a haircut, he's like, wow, your hair's all over the place. It really is. So, so I, say, I say to him, yeah, my hair, grows, my hair grows the way I think. It's all over the place. So, so uh, uh, what was I saying? So anyway, oh, just that, see, that's, uh, my hair grows all the way, I think. Um, Oh, what was I saying? I was saying Judge something. favorably the, the, the car situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But how did I get to my hair? Oh. <laughs> Chavetz Chaim. says that we think all over the place. He says one of the reasons that we think all over the place and we have so many different thoughts is so that we can have the power to judge favorably. Isn't that interesting? Whoa. There's one of the powerful reasons that we have internally all these thoughts is so that we can think in a better way of others so that we wouldn't get into arguments with them. It's a, it's a muscle that needs to be trained. You know the story of the guy with the, with the chips, right? That's a famous one. They even made a video about it, right? You know that story? Yeah, no. the, the guy, they're sitting at, chips? what? What kind of chips? Oh, I don't know, it's the good ones. No, it's cookies. You're talking about the airplane? Cookies, the guy the cookies and the airplane. You know that story? Yeah, and then find out that. Yeah, 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 don't ruin it. I tell, does everyone else know? No. Do you know the story? I'll tell you the story. Yeah. Okay, so the story of uh, a guy who's got a bag of cookies and he's at the airport and he's sitting and he's uh, maybe he's on the plane or not on the plane, whatever, he's sitting down and he, he's running, he quickly goes to the store, he gets his bag of chips and he sits down and finally he's tired. He opens his bag of chips and he's reading his newspaper, he's doing his work and all of a sudden, as he's eating his chips, the guy next to him is a cookies. I went from cookies to chips. I told you, my hair's all over the place. The guy next to him is just puts his hand casually in his back. Uh, and he's like, what the, what the heck's going on? So he keeps quiet, you know, okay, fine, whatever, I'll let him. I'll let him do it. He takes one cookie and then, you know, I take a cookie. The guy that's with his laptop takes a cookie. After another few minutes, the guy is getting, puts his hand in, he takes another cookie. Finally, there's one cookie left. Do they have anything special? Wait, let me tell you. They're really good. They're Oreos. Okay? There's one left. Did they touch hands? No, they didn't touch hands. No, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's a story I'll tell you on a date night. So, uh, you know, on a, on a date night event, I mean. You know, no, they don't. So, 
So let's say there's a bag of cookies, right? And, uh, and there's one left. There was one cookie left. Okay, one Oreo cookie left. And the guy with his laptop's about to finally, okay, fine, one left. I gave him all those. He's about to put his hand in, and the other guy just slips his hand in and takes the last cookie and walks off. And he's like, oh my gosh, this is insane. The guy goes off, he gets to his plane, he's on his line, and he gets back, he carries on with his bag, he moves and he gets onto the plane. He gets onto the plane, he opens his bag, and what's he seeing there? The entire fresh bag of cookies, Oreo cookies. And he's like, oh my goodness, it wasn't even my bag. It was that guy's bag of cookies. So, uh, but let's imagine this, let's imagine this. Let's take that story to another level. Let's take that story to another level. Well, I don't know. I think this actually... Yeah, this is, I thought it was like, what? That's a great Oreo commercial. It's a great Oreo commercial. They actually made a video of it on YouTube. There's a video of it. It's went around. I thought it was a Jewish story because I heard it at a parent's retreat. Oh, maybe. Yeah, it could be. So, so let, let me take that story to another level, though. That's, that's where the rabbi comes in. Let me take that story to another level. Here's the next level. Let's say... I know the person that was taking that, those cookies. And at first, I'm taking the cookies, then they're taking the cookies, then I find out that that person walks off and I realize I had the cookies all along and that person was giving me their cookies. And I see that person down the road. And let's say I never found the cookies in my bag. Let's say I left, my, I left the cookies on my chair. And a few weeks later, I walk down that road and I see that person that was sitting next to me eating from my bag. What am I going to think? Oh, that's, the guy that took that's the guy that took all my cookies. How dare them? How this? How that? How could he have done it? Imagine the amount of resentment and pain and hate that can go in that person when really it wasn't... It was $5 cookies. It was, well, it was cookies. But it was, that's another point. It's only $5 <laughs> cookies. What the heck's going on? But imagine, and it wasn't even theirs. I took from their bag. Who's done the kafschut for? Who's judging favorably for? And the answer is, it's for you more than that person. When it says judge everybody, all of that person favorably, it's for you, not for them. It's for you. That's what it's saying. And here's the last thing. It says, make yourself a master, buy yourself a friend. But if you do that and you don't judge others favorably, you're never going to have real friends and you're never going to have a teacher. You want to learn? You want to grow? You want to build a community? You want to... One of the biggest aspects, someone asked me before, can you judge, does judging favorably have apply to all of them? Of course it does. And if you have all three, you're, a, you're what we would call a beast. And uh, you're able to really cope with people and get along with people, learn from people, be there for others, right? It's all, all aspects. It's a beautiful teaching. And um, I guess that's it. I hope you guys had fun. And I'm looking forward to the next one. Any questions, ideas, thoughts? Judging favorably? I know that you could have said that story in the cookies way better than me. It is a great story. Huh? Oh, okay. Anyway, all right, thank you. Fine.